Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's stand this morning. Hallelujah. The Lord is good, isn't he? The Bible tells us that this is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Amen. And we want so very much to open up our hearts and our minds to the Lord Jesus Christ, that he would do a work in our life. We would take him by the hand and he would lead us and guide us. How many want to be led and guided by the Lord today? Amen. I'm willing to do that. Why don't we lift our hands and ask the Lord to bless today as we enter into his presence together. We love you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, for your goodness in our life. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the victories, the joys, your presence, God, and your spirit. We can't live without you, Lord Jesus. We must have you every moment of the day. So, Lord, today we've come to acknowledge you. We've come, Lord Jesus, to affirm our need of you. We've come, Lord God, with an open heart and an open mind to receive from you as we give you glory and praise. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for it. God bless today. Bless every single person, all of our classes that are spread out throughout the building. We ask, God, that you would anoint each and every place where your presence is being made known. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say amen. Amen. David says in the Psalms, he said he wanted to his soul to bless the Lord. He didn't cry out, Lord, I'm looking for you to bless me necessarily, but he wanted to have a dual highway of blessing the Lord and the Lord blessing him. And today we want that to happen. We want to bless the Lord and we want the Lord to bless us. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, Bless the Lord, Thank you, Lord. 
We want to bless you today, God. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you turn around to two or three people, put a big smile on your face. Why don't you welcome somebody? If you don't know them, introduce yourself. Let them know you're glad to be in the house of the Lord with each and every person today. our God.
house of the Lord this morning. How about you? Come on, how many is glad to be in the house of the Lord? Oh, I'm glad. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Blessed be your name, the land that is plentiful, where the seeds of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the ground in the desert place. Go walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Let's sing it again from the top. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. In the land that's plentiful. Let's go. Let's be your name. Ooh, I'm gonna bless 
Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord this morning. Is he mighty in your life this morning? Does he reign in your life this morning? Is he king over your situation? He is the, the master of the problem that's in your life right now. The song we're going to sing is about how God reigns. We're seeing him in his rightful place of rulership. We're seeing him in his rightful place of kinship. We're seeing him in his rightful place of being Lord over everything. Hallelujah. How God reigns. My God reigns. How God reigns. My God reigns. Lord, you reign above every name. How God reigns. My God reigns. How God reigns. How God reigns. Lord, you reign above every name. With power and majesty, dominion, authority, you reign. Yes, he does. Hallelujah. With power and majesty, dominion, authority, you reign. Come on, take it higher. Oh, how God reigns. for you this morning. Power Does he reign over your situation? Put him in his rightful place this morning. At the top, my God reigns. 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 Lord, you reign above every name. His name is above all names. My God reigns. His name is above cancer. My God reigns. His name is above financial difficulty. His name is above every circumstance in your life. Power and majesty. Circumstance. You reign. Let he reigns. Over my circumstance. 
holes in my circumstance. being mighty in our midst. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Because he reigns and we're part of his body, we could reign with him. Hallelujah. His power's in this place. He reigns over our circumstances. He's way above that. Hallelujah. There's nothing that's too hard for our God to accomplish in our lives when we give ourselves to him. When we pray today, we're going to go to him in prayer right now. And when we pray today, let's pray that his perfect will and plan is done. Let's pray according to God's will for our circumstances, for our lives. Amen? All right. You can remain stand. Well, you may be seated. You may be seated. We have several victory reports. Uh, Elia Rosado has received a new job, four-day week, with full-time benefits and paid vacation. I like that, four-day week. Praise God. Let your requests be made known unto God. Pray. I'm wondering why I didn't pray for a three-day week, but we'll take the four-day, right? Amen. Uh, Sylvia Perez Rathal, her brother Isaac, will not need bone marrow transplant. We prayed for him last week, and he's reacting well to his chemo, and she wants to thank the church for their prayer. Also, Marjorie Harris is thanking God for 19 children at Damascus Outreach yesterday, and we rejoice about that. Awesome. God is doing some great things. When we give ourselves to him, he just responds in a big way. Uh, we, now for our prayer request. Uh, 
Zeta Forbes, is Scott Forbes' mom. She's having surgery, I guess, this coming week. And uh, we want God to touch her and be with her and heal her. Uh, also, let's keep Sister Jennifer Johnson in prayer. She had surgery about a week ago. Uh, she wouldn't be here, is she? Is she here? Okay. Well, let's keep her in prayer that God heals her speedily. Uh, Leopold Wiley needs prayer. Uh, they're looking for a home in Frederick, and he wants less. He's asking that we pray for less. Uh, he wants a less commute, and he's in the information technology. Um, Brother Hubbard, we want to wants prayer for his wife, Sister Hubbard. We want to pray for her, and uh, she's doing better, but she's not all the way there yet. And we want God to continue to heal her. Uh, Sister Spalding for Coretta Jefferson, she's going uh, in for testing for cancer, and we want that test to come out negative. In Jesus' name, praise God. All right, if you're here today and you put a prayer request in, please stand. Or if you need prayer and you did not put a prayer request in, stand also at this time, and we're going to lift you up in your needs. All right, we got people here. We got more prayer requests than people standing. Okay, there we go. All right, saints, let's go to these that are standing. Let's lift them up in their needs. Everybody find somebody to pray with. Let's stand. Let's lift each other up to the Lord right now in Jesus' name. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your wonderful presence that sits in his place. Your miracle power, God, that's flowing right now to those that are hurting, God. Hallelujah. We thank you, God. Hallelujah for being God with us. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, God that your perfect will and plan is being done in our lives. Thank you for touching Coretta Jefferson, God. We curse and rebuke any form of cancer. That these tests come back negative, God. We thank you for it, God. We thank you that there's no cancer. Thank you for continuing to heal Sister Hubbard, God. Flow over her, God right now, even in the room she's at. Fill that room with your glory and your virtue that you would heal her, God. We thank you for providing for the Wileys, God, a new home, God, a new job, better commute, God. We know it's your will, God. We know it's your perfect will, Lord. In Jesus' name, we lift up Scott Forbes' mom to you, God. Thank you for healing her. Thank you for healing her, God. Thank you for being with her during this time of surgery, God. Hallelujah. Let everything go well, God. In Jesus' name. We lift up Jennifer Johnson to you right now, God. Thank you for a speedy recovery, God. Thank you for bringing her back to the house of God next week, God. Totally healed. Totally ready to move in you. Lord, we praise you. We honor you. Hallelujah. Let's lift him up. Let's lift him up. We praise you. We thank you, Lord, for what's taking place right now. We thank you for the victories we heard here today. And we thank you for the victories we're going to hear next week. God, we just love you and praise you. Thank you. Thank you for being mighty in our midst and moving in this place today. That's it. Let's clap our hands up. our prayers. Do we believe that? Hallelujah. And if you believe that God is doing a work for you in your life, why don't we give him a hand of praise and thanksgiving. Hallelujah. He's a prayer answering God. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We want to go to the Lord in our giving this morning. And what a blessed people we are. How many could say amen to that? How many could say amen? I'm a blessed person. Amen. The Lord is good to each and every one of us. Our ushers have envelopes for you for designation of funds, and we want to allow ourselves to be in uh, the lineup of the Lord's obedience. So our giving is a part of that. 
Not only is our time, not only is our talent, but also our finances. And so this morning, uh, we give an opportunity for each and every one of us to participate in that. If you're a guest or a visitor and you want to participate, you're more than welcome to. There's a principle in giving. Amen. But we're not asking for your money. Amen. We'll go ahead and receive that in Jesus' name. We'll pray over it after we've received it. A couple of announcements to be made aware of. Hopefully you have your bulletin. If you don't have a bulletin or weren't able to get a bulletin, all of this is on our website at www.cleast.org. A couple just upcoming things. We have a big youth event, uh, Recharge it's called, October 18th and 19th. And you want to see uh, Pastor Glass for more information. And it's an overnight trip. And if your young person want, wants to be a part of that or you want your young person to be a part of that, then we encourage that very much. It's going to be a tremendous time. It's in Salisbury. And uh, it is an overnight trip. There's a cost involved with that. Also, our ladies' conference, the Maryland, D.C. District Ladies' Conference is quickly approaching uh, at the end of October and uh, just sort of planning ahead to that. You don't want to miss that. There's a registration uh, for that also. There's information in the information booth for that. If you are new here to Christian Life Center, you'd like to either deepen your walk with God, your knowledge of God, or actually enter into uh, membership here at Christian Life Center, uh, we have what's called the Journey Class, quickly approaching October 19th. It will be here on site at Christian Life Center. You'll be getting more information about that. But in the bulletin and on our website, there is an uh, a opportunity to sign up for that. And uh, we want everyone that wants to have a deeper relationship with God and a deeper understanding of the Lord to sign up for that. And, and that's a wonderful class that also allows you to, uh, to be a part of the different ministries here at Christian Life Center. Amen. I guess also turn off your cell phones, too, if you'll feel that way. Yeah? <laughs> Amen. That is... That is an interesting little piece of information. Cell phones. Amen. Tonight's our life group. And uh, if you are a part of life groups, I'm sure you're enjoying that. If you're not a part of life groups and you would like more information about that, in the information booth immediately after the service, there'll be someone there to help you. Yeah, what we have is a life group probably very close to where you live. It's a small group of people that have gathered together to do exactly what we do in this sanctuary, just in a neighborhood level. And so we want everybody that wants to be a part of that to be a part of that. At the back of your bulletin, I should have said this in the beginning, at the back of your bulletin is a little perforated uh, form that you can tear off, and there's more information uh, that we will be able to get to you. If you put your name, email address, or maybe a phone number, we would love to give you any information that we might have. And uh, we just welcome everybody here today. Hallelujah. And it's good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Amen. Our senior pastor is preaching in California, and uh, he uh, has been there for the last part of uh, last week into the weekend, and we want to just, uh, in our own personal time, pray that God would continue to do a work where he is and allow him to minister to the people in which he is ministering to. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Let's pray over our giving this morning. Amen. Stretch forth your hands toward the offering, and let's ask the Lord to bless us. Father, we love you and praise you, and we thank you for this time to give, Lord. We want to be just like you. You give so much to us, Lord, and we want to partner with you for your kingdom's work. Thank you for your favor in our lives. Thank you for rebuking the devourer out of our lives, and thank you for this opportunity to worship you in Jesus' name. Everybody say, in Jesus' name, amen. just wanted to let you know that we are starting to receive a lot of people to come to our altar to pray for the Holy Ghost. And there's an opportunity that you're going to hear about in the next week or so. We're going to send out an email with some dates. If you would like to be part of our altar counseling uh, service, then please uh, when, respond to the email. Uh, we'll, again, we'll provide a date, but it's a vital ministry that where we could be a blessing to somebody and we need more people at the altar to help shore up the nets and bring the fish in amen 
All right. Uh, several of you signed up in the past. We'll have an altar council training coming up. And again, all that will be in an email coming up very soon. And I just wanted to give you a heads up about it. God bless. Amen. And we are certainly thankful for everybody that's a part of something here at Christian Life Center because there are many needs. Amen. Amen. And that altar counseling uh, group of people uh, is more than just helping someone receive the gift of the Holy Ghost or guiding them through that. It's to be a prayer partner with somebody that comes down to the altar. Because there are many needs that are represented during any particular service. And uh, there are people who have never prayed before, people who have never uh, communicated with the Lord on a personal level. And so as an altar counselor, you are there to help guide them and explain to them a deeper understanding about how to communicate with our Lord and Savior. It's just like communicating with somebody that you're very familiar with. He just wants to hear us talk, and he'll talk right back to us. Amen? It's good to have communication with the Lord. A couple more of announcements. We are quickly approaching uh, Christmas, and we are presenting a drama here at Christian Life Center through our Christmas presentation. And there is a meeting right after the service directly behind the stage in the choir practice room. If you just keep going that way, figure out a way to go keep going that way. Uh, if you're interested in being a part of the drama team in any capacity, it is not a covenant membership uh, situation. Anybody that would like to participate uh, in the drama, then we encourage that immediately after the service in the choir practice room. Uh, we will be having a short meeting there announcing that. And I think we have a, a, just a promo video. We have been announcing our She's for Christ offering, and uh, this is sort of the final day for that. And uh, we want to just show a little video uh, promoting that. Acts 1-8 tells us that we will receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon us. As spirit-filled believers, we are empowered to show forth the praises of Him who has called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. Activate that power today. It's simple, it's biblical, and it works. Partnering with She's for Christ brings light to people all over the world.
Amen. Obviously, we are a little past September the 8th, but our Sheets for Christ offering, uh, if you were able to pick up from that, is uh, money that's distributed throughout the world, actually, uh, to help uh, different ministries uh, keep going, get started, and uh, facilitate the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Very special guest we have with us today. We want to welcome uh, Pastor Boy. He is the General Superintendent for Burma, and he is here today. We're very excited about him being here. Amen. We are endeavoring to partner with uh, the people of Burma. There is, a, there is quite a bit uh, of population of uh, people from Burma in this area. I'd say somewhere around 2,000 or so, something like that, uh, in this area. And we are trying to partner with them and provide a space for them and facilitate into that culture. Uh, they need a church. Amen. They need a place to worship. Amen. So we're glad that he's here. Amen. Choir, lift up the name of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs>
take a moment to acknowledge your presence in this place, Lord Jesus. Come and lay down the burdens you have carried for in this sanctuary. God is here. He is here. He is here to break the yoke and to lift the heavy burden. Anybody feel a little heavy laden in this place today? He is here. He Let's agree with him right now. Let's agree with him right now. Let's agree with him right now. Agree with him. Let him do what he please in this place. We might as well agree with him right now. Come on, let's agree with him. Let's agree with him. Let's agree with him. Speak, Lord, your servant here.
Hallelujah. Isaiah 10 and 35 declares that we should not cast away our confidence, which have great recompense of reward. After you've done the will of God, after you've done the will of God, that's when he's going to show forth his might in your life. The song we're about to sing is about expectation. Expect the great. Whatever you've been trusting God for, waiting on God for, whatever you've been up all night praying about, whatever I've been gnawing at you and causing you to lose sleep and, and sometimes asking God, are you there? Instead of asking God, saying to God, I know you're here. That's the great we're singing about this morning. Not more money in the bank. Not a better uh, situation in our employment. Not for us to get wealthy and rich or whatever. But the great is, Lord, help me to get through this storm right here. This is the great I'm talking about. If I can make it through this storm, this is the great for me. One day at a time, you remember that song? One day at a time, sweet Jesus. If I could just make it through today, that's the great for me. That's the great for me. I'm expecting that great. And I won't cast away my confidence. Because it's my confidence that's going to reward me. Right, Pastor? Hallelujah. Expect the great. Anticipate. 
And how many believe that the blessing is on you? Hallelujah. Let's stand this morning. And what a great presence of the Lord that is here today. Hallelujah. The Lord is good, isn't he? The Bible tells us that he's good, his mercy is everlasting, and his grace is sufficient. That means whatever we may be going through, whatever challenge we may be facing, whatever part of the journey we are on at the present moment, He is able, not only is He able, He's willing to join us and has full capacity to be a part of our journey and help us through that particular part of the journey. And I'm glad about that. How about you? How many, how many was helped by the Lord at some point in your life? Hallelujah. I'm glad about it. Well, it's certainly good to be in the house of the Lord. Thank you, choir. And uh, what a great feeling there is in the house. Brother Dino, if I could just get a little more monitor on this particular mic. Thank you. I appreciate it. If you wouldn't mind going to the, your Bible and turning to the book of Acts chapter 17. Thank you. Today, if you are a you're a note taker, if you like to write down scriptures so that you can go back over them, today will be a day full of opportunity. Today we will be going through a lot of scripture. It's my intention today to deliver to you a very, very narrow subject with enough scripture to back it up, to provide an opportunity for us to respond to that. Whether the response is today or whether the response is forthcoming, it's only through the power of the Word of God that we're able to understand where we are and where we need to be. Can somebody say amen to that? And I want to be where God wants me to be. How about you? Acts chapter 17, verse number 28. The Bible says, for in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own prophets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto Everybody hold up one finger, gold, hold up two fingers, silver, hold up three fingers, stone, graven by art and man's device. Now, there's a whole bunch that we could preach on right there. We don't need to think the Godhead is divided up. We don't need to think that the Godhead is anything that's man-made. And the times of this ignorance, God winked at. But now commandeth all men everywhere to do what? To repent. Why? Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Wherefore he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Verse number 30, in the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. And I want to speak to you today, preach to you today, talk to you out of the word of the Lord today about the subject of repentance. Life's turning point, repentance. Let's put our Bibles down. Let's lift our hands to heaven. And let's ask God to touch us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word. We thank you, Lord God, for your spirit that is already present in this place. We thank you, Lord, that our hearts are set open to you, to receive you. And, Lord God, we would ask that your word, Lord God, would go forth that it would bless, help, encourage, uplift, convict, Lord Jesus. Call for a response upon our part. 
We thank you, Lord Jesus, for every individual that's here. We ask, Lord God, that you would cause there to be a heart change. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say amen. Amen. You may be seated. I think the closer that we get to the coming of the Lord, the more watered down the word of the Lord becomes. I think in the generation in which we find ourselves, the enemy recognizes that his time is short. The Bible tells us this. That the enemy knows that his time is short and he's working overtime and doing his best to deceive, to distract, and to sidetrack every single person of the human race from obtaining a righteous relationship with the Almighty God. It's common to hear preaching that encourages a person to accept the Lord as your personal Savior. It's common to hear that that is the beginning and the end of the salvific process in which one would meet the Heavenly Father, would retain their right into heaven, and spend eternity with our Lord and Savior. But the Bible never talks about us accepting Him. In fact, we should be eternally grateful that He ever chose to accept us. Thank the Lord that His arms are open wide to us. Thank the Lord that His hand is not short, His ear is not deaf, and His eyes are not blind to where we are, but but He makes Himself available. And so the Bible never talks about us accepting Him. The Bible teaches that actual conversion cannot take place without something called repentance. Jesus taught us in Luke chapter 13 and verse number 3, he says, I tell you, nay, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Now, I'm just getting started in this message, and I'm going to ask you, it's, this is not like last week, this isn't Brother Dross. He has the, the ultimate preacher voice. And maybe if I'd used his voice in this message, it would be good. You guys ripped and roared, and I couldn't shake this week the feeling of needing to speak about this subject. And so I ask that your attention be given, and if you believe something that I'm saying, say amen. If you think it will help you, say amen. If you think it will help somebody next to you, say amen. And if you don't believe anything i got to say, say amen, it will hurry me up. And so I I ask for your attention. But Jesus says, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. The Bible tells us that John the Baptist came preaching repentance. In fact, in the scriptures, both John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus Christ began their ministries with a call to repentance. Matthew chapter 3, the Bible tells us in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying this. This was his message. Repent ye, for the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus came preaching in Matthew 4, 17 from the time that Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And just prior to returning To heaven, in his ascension, Jesus reminded his disciples in Luke 24 and 47, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. And what's that name? Among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. The Bible tells us, as we read in our text, that the times of this ignorance God winked at, the ignorance of not knowing Him, the ignorance of not having a true understanding of Him. But now, He commanded
this, all men everywhere to repent. That sounds quite inclusive, doesn't it? All mankind everywhere is called to repentance. He follows up in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. He says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is what? He's long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What is he, what is he telling us there? He's, he's telling us that if I've told you I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, and I am willing to hang with you as long as it takes. But in order for this process to truly begin in one's life, it must start with repentance. Jesus felt very strongly that it was necessary for repentance to be preached in every nation and that the need for repentance is universal for one simple reason, because sin is universal. Sin has touched every human life. It, the Bible tells us it entered through the fall of Adam. In Romans 5.12, the Bible tells us, Wherefore, as by one man sinned in, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. We know this scripture in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. But there is a promise in 1 John 1 and 9 that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Repentance comes about when we confess our sins. That's what repentance is all about. True confession is when we say the same thing about sin that God says about sin. And I believe we live in a world that does not view sin the same way that God views sin. I believe we live in a world that has has uh, taken sin in and has become friend of sin and has allowed allowance for sin and has given space and given room to sin. And so when sin has entered into the heart of mankind, it is a challenge to recognize it for what it is. Because the world in which we live has moved away from the understanding that anything that opposes God, anything that takes me out of the presence of God, anything that destroys my relationship with God, anything that degrades Him, anything that takes Him out of being number one in my life, anything that opposes Him is simply sin. And sin must be dealt with. That's why in the book of Genesis we find that Adam and Eve, the Bible says that when you eat of the tree, you shall surely die. What was he talking about? Was he talking about a physical death? No, they did not die physically at that point, but they were put on a trajectory of physical death. Because Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden were made to live forever. But as a result of sin entering into their life, it put them on the path to death. But the true death was the spiritual death in which they had to deal with. How do we know of that spiritual death? Because they were driven out of the garden, the Bible says. They were separated from God. That's the death that sin does. Sin separates mankind from God. And repentance is the beginning process to regain our
ourselves into the presence of God. Biblical repentance is simply this. An inward change of attitude leading to an outward change of action. And unless both of these occur, then real repentance has not taken place. How many have children? We see this and we understand this. How many, how many has, your, has your child come up to you and, and, and said, I'm sorry? Right? And then five minutes later, they did the exact same thing again. Anybody? I've heard of people like that. And what do we say? You're not sorry. You're sorry you got caught. You're not sorry for what you did because you're not viewing the action the same way that I'm viewing the action. And if you were viewing the action the same way that I was viewing the action, then you would feel the same way about this thing that I'm feeling, and there would be a not only an inward change, but there would be the result of an outward change, meaning that you would not participate in that any longer. That is what repentance is. Repentance is the first and most important step in the plan of salvation. Repentance is a very important step, and immediately, it's immediately following believing. So believing is initiated in our life, and then repentance happens, and that takes man towards God and the forgiveness of his sins. That's why in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, we see the sequence when Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The very first part of the process is repentance. The next part of the process is baptism. And baptism is only for the remission of sins. Baptism is for nothing else. Baptism in the scriptures is for remission of sins. There's nowhere in the scriptures that tells us that baptism is an outward expression of an inward decision. That's repentance. Repentance is shown outwardly as a result of a decision to be remorseful and sorry about the actions in which I took. Then baptism is the follow-up to that remorse and that's where we can be forgiven of our sins and remitted of all of those sins. The nature of repentance is not only turning from, but also turning to. Repentance will cause a person to stop a wrong action and begin a right one. Acts chapter 3 verse 19 says, repent therefore. And what? Be converted that your sins may be blotted out. How are our sins blotted out? Our sins are only blotted out through the act of baptism. And then when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. If you're a Bible understander or reader, you would know that the times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord is the infilling of His Spirit in our life. Peter, uh, Paul, the writer Paul later claimed in Acts 20 and 20, he says, And now I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I have showed you and I have taught you publicly from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, what? Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was saying that we must turn 
to God in repentance. Matthew 12 and 34 says, when a, when a person is sorry for his sins, he'll want to confess it. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. When a heart recognizes their need for God and repentance towards God, it starts in our heart and comes out of our mouth. Repentance involves turning from sin to the Lord. It is a turning point in my life. And as the individual is walking one way, the sinful way, repentance allows an individual to make an about face and start walking in the opposite direction toward God. I'm going to come sit down there. Repentance, though, is not complete. The act is not complete without baptism. Because repentance is a type of death. And death always comes before the burial. And baptism is a type of burial. And the Bible teaches that we should repent and be baptized. That's what he told us in Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And what's the promise? Ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Repentance and baptism go hand in hand. And they should not be separated or divided. They are experienced together, accomplishing God's full work of forgiveness in the heart of the believer. In Luke 24 and 47, the Bible says, And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And after repentance and baptism in Jesus' name, we don't need to stop there. But we still need the baptism of the Holy Spirit in our life. For the baptism of the Holy Spirit gives us the power to continue to overcome sin. And without the power of the Holy Ghost, uh, we will continue in sin. So it makes no sense to, for my heart to be convicted, for me to make a decision to turn, for me to get baptized in the name of Jesus, having all of my sins remitted, but still being under my power, still being under my authority. What I need is the authority of God in my life. I need the infilling of the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Ghost that will make me walk right. It's the Holy Ghost that gives me the ability to talk right. It's the Holy Ghost that gives me the ability to think right. It's the Holy Ghost that gives me the ability to say no to sin and yes to a righteous uh, life in God. I need the Holy Ghost. Uh, but I need to repent first. Uh, I need to be baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of my sins. Uh, and I'm a candidate for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. <coughs> the Bible tells us in Mark 16 and 16 that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. What we are taught determines what we believe. And what we believe determines what we do. And what we do determines our destiny. In Isaiah 55, in verse number 7, the Bible says, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Ezekiel 18 and 21 says, But if the wicked shall turn from all his sins that he hath committed, and keep all of my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live and shall not die. Proverbs 28 and 18, Whosoever walketh uprightly shall be saved, but he, but he that is perverse in his ways shall fall 
at once. I want you to know that after you're born again, after you've repented, after you've been baptized in His name, after you have received the gift of the Holy Ghost, there will likely be times that you stumble. There will likely be times that you fall. There will likely be times that sin is a part of your life. And as a Christian, we endeavor to live above sin. But there is the occasional stumble. And it's at that moment that we should repent. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. That's what we are striving to do. That's what we are living to do. That's what we are called to do. That's what the power of the Holy Ghost gives us the ability to do. But at the end of the day, I still got to make a decision to not sin through the power of the Holy Ghost. He says, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Verse number 2, he says, and he is the propitiation for our sins. And not only for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. We have a place to run. We have a place to run, but if we do not run to that place, then sin will continually take root in our life and will overcome us and will destroy us. So if we don't know God, we need to repent. And if we know God and we stumble, we need to repent. The question may be asked, what does God do with our sins once they are forgiven? Because I can guarantee you, my memory is pretty good. And sometimes the devil uses my memory to defeat me, uses my memory to bring up and drudge up old sins and old challenges and say, see, you, you, you're not a, God doesn't love you. Look at how, what kind of person you are. Look what you have done. But I've got to view sin through the lens that God views sin. After I have repented and after God has accepted my repentant heart, I need to now view that sin like God views that sin. The Bible says in Micah 7 and 19 that he puts the sins in the bottom of the sea. He says he will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities and Thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. I need to recognize that. I need to see sin after repentance like God sees sin. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 38 and 17 that he puts our sins behind his back. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. For thou hast cast all my sin behind thy back. Where's the back of God? Where's the front of God? Where's the sides of God? God is one that occupies all time and all space. I can travel for eternity and never find the back of God. That's what God says he does with my sin. When I come to repent to him, when I come uh, to find that place of repentance, the Bible says that he puts them behind his back. I need to view my sin after repentance just like like God views my sin. It's way behind his back. And I need to tell the devil, the devil, you can't find them. I can't find them. God can't see them. They're behind his back. And I'm going to be victorious. Uh, I've been forgiven. I've come to God. And he's forgiven me of my sins. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah 31 and 34 that he does not remember them anymore. 
And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, saying, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Devil, you can drudge it up all you want. Devil, you can remind me all you want. But I'm looking at my sin the same way that God looks at my sin. Now, I've got a better memory than God does, apparently. And I've got I've to conquer that. And I've got to say I've got victory over that. And I've got to say the Lord has told me that he doesn't remember it any longer. And if God doesn't remember it, then I don't remember it. It's because it's the memory of sin that will stop me from executing the power of God in my life. It's the memory of iniquity that will stop me from teaching a Bible study. It'll stop me from praying for the sick. It'll stop me from exercising my birthright in the kingdom of God. God has forgiven me. God has blotted it out. God has taken it and put it behind his back. And the devil can't bring it up. The devil can't wag it before my eyes. I've been set free by the power of repentance. Come on, somebody. You need to recognize that you've been set free if you have repented of your sins. The devil can't dangle it out in front of you. You need to walk in the authority and the power of Jesus' name and say, I'm a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. Behold, all things are passed away. And all things have become new. If you're sitting in this sanctuary and you've been bound by your past, uh, I set you free this morning. If you're sitting in this sanctuary and God has called you to activate into a ministry, God has called you to tell your testimony and you can't do it because you don't feel worthy, you feel ashamed, you feel like God doesn't want to use you, uh, but you have truly repented of your sin, then you need to break the chains uh, of the devil in your life life uh, and tell the devil I've been set free in Jesus name by the power of his blood in my life come on somebody you need to exercise the authority of Jesus forgiveness in your life my God if the devil can keep you bound up from your past uh, then he'll keep uh, the future from unfolding uh, in your life. Uh, but there's one thing that I know. God promised me. God promised me. God promised me. And he's going to do it in my life. But I've got to accept it. I've got to see it like he sees it. The Bible tells us lastly what he does with my sin. In Psalms 103 the Bible says that as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. The distance from the north to the south can be measured. There's a point that you can go to called the South Pole. And there's a point you can go to called the North Pole. That's a, there's an actual place. There's a flag in there probably. It's defined. <laughs> but God didn't say, I have taken your sins and I have moved them as far as this point to this point. Something we can calculate. Something we can define. And something the devil could eventually measure out in your life. But God said, I have taken your sins and I have moved them from you as far as the east is from the west. Now I can promise you, ladies and gentlemen, if you leave this place and you get a compass and you start going east, you're never going to find it. You'll go east until you get back to this building. If you turn around and go west, you're never going to find where west is. That's how far removed. When I come and I bow my knee to him and I say, Lord, I'm dirty, God. 
I've done wrong, Lord, in my life. I've transgressed against you, Lord Jesus. And I see sin like you see sin, God. I'm asking you to forgive me today, Lord Jesus. He takes that. And he moves that. As far as you can calculate the distance from east and west is. Thank you, Jesus, for it. There's a freedom in seeing repented sin as Jesus sees repented sin. How do I repent? How do I repent? The Bible tells us in Luke 18 and 13, which you don't have, Brother Tony, it says, confess my sins to God. There's three basic principles of repentance. The first one is that I've, I've got to talk to them. I've got to tell them. It's important that I truly confess to him. Now, a good question might be, do I have to list all the sins that I've ever done? We may not have time. And we may not remember them all. And the Lord knows our heart when we come to Him and we begin to talk about, Lord, I, I've sinned against you. I recognize that, Lord. These things that I'm doing in my life is, is opposing to you. He understands. He's not asking for you to list every single infraction. He's not asking you to list every single occasion. He's not asking you to list every single thing. He's asking you to confess that you're a sinner to Him. James chapter 5, verse 16, Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24, the Bible gives us the principle of confessing to our brothers and sisters if we have wronged them. That's repentance. If I have offended anyone, I need that with forgiveness in my life. What if they won't forgive me? That's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to ask. The Bible promises us that if we ask God to forgive us, that He will forgive us. The Bible doesn't promise us that if we ask our brother to forgive us, that they will forgive us. But the command is, is that we find a place of repentance. And then thirdly, the third principle of how to repent repent. Proverbs 28, 13, Isaiah 55 and 7 is to make a decision to forsake sin. Repentance is simply to turn away from the way you are going, asking God for forgiveness. See, the direction that I am traveling without the Lord is the direction that I have determined on my own. And when I recognize that my actions and the things that I'm a part of are separating me from God and taking me away from His presence and His goodness and His mercy, and every now and then I sense Him, and every now and then I feel Him, but I'm not living that every day. I've got to recognize that the direction that I'm going is incorrect, and I must make a conscious decision. Turn my life around and begin to walk in a new direction. Now, it's an unfamiliar direction. It's a path that I'm not very familiar with, thus causes some uncomfortableness. This other path, man, I can, I can do it with my eyes closed and skip and turn. and man, I know exactly what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. But this new way is something that must be done intentionally. Repentance is more than just asking the Lord for forgiveness. Repentance, coupled together with asking the Lord to forgive us, is an inward decision to turn direction. Bible tells us that the goodness of God 
leads men to repentance and should not be despised. Musicians, if you'll come. Romans chapter 2, verse 4, he says, Or deepest thou the reaches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? What is it that we're feeling here this morning? It's the goodness of God. What purpose is the goodness of God? It's to lead us to repentance. His whole purpose of making himself known to us is that we might make a decision to get closer to him. The whole purpose of him manifesting himself in our presence is that we might say, I need this. I need this every day. I need this in my life. What is separating me from this? What is taking me away from this? And the Bible will lead us through his goodness, uh, through his forbearance, through his long suffering. Uh, it will lead a person uh, to say, God, I'm sorry for not living for you. Forgive me, God, of my sins. Uh, I'm making a decision this morning uh, to turn in a new direction. The presentation of the gospel will lead one to repentance. The death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But in Romans chapter 10, verse 14, he tells us this simply. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him on whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Ladies and gentlemen, that word preacher is not designated for this pulpit alone. But everybody's life is preaching a message. And we are preaching the message of the death, burial, and resurrection. And we are preaching it to people that need to hear it. And people that need to hear it, as a result of hearing your life, have the opportunity to believe. And as a result of believing, leads a person to repentance. And repentance starts them on the journey of full salvation in their life. We need to be convicted of our sins. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost, and I'm almost through. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse 37. And when they had heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? There needs to be something rise up in each and every one of us this morning. And calculate where I am in my life. And say, God, what do I need to do today? I've heard, I know, and I believe the message. And where I am in my journey, what do I need to do today? First, we need to accept the fact that there may be sin in our life. Romans 3 and 23 says, for all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. And we need to understand as Romans 6.23 says. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. We need to recognize that God himself. Robed in flesh provided a savior for us. In Matthew 1.21. And she shall bring forth the son and thou shalt call his name. Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. John 4 and 42, and he said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard them ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. One person repents, confesses his sins, He's not only sorry for his sins, but makes a decision to forsake sin and make a turnaround towards God. The Bible says that as a result of that in Psalms 32 and 1, that heaven rejoices when a sinner repents. Blessed is he whose transgression 
is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Luke 15 and 10 says, Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repented. Why are they excited about it? Because they started the journey. Repentance is the beginning of the salvific journey of salvation in Jesus Christ. Because repentance drives us to baptism. And baptism drives us to the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And the infilling of the Holy Ghost is what allows a person to live an overcoming life in Christ Jesus. Let's stand. The time for repentance, though, is limited. Turn to your neighbor and say, the time for repentance is limited. It's limited to the extent of our earthly life. There is no repentance after death. There is no doctrine in the scriptures of praying for the dead. Only the living can pray for the living. And only the living can repent. And I will tell you there is no reason this morning to put repentance for our sins and living for God off until another day. Because the Bible says we're not promised tomorrow that life is but a vapor. It's here, and then it's gone. Sure, we look ahead in old age and we say we're never going to get there. Never going to. Some of us are looking back and saying, how did we get here? Ain't that right, Brother Marauder? We're looking, we're looking back going, how in the world did I get here? Man, I can't run. I can't climb stairs very much. I can't hardly do anything. I'm tired. Right? Anybody feel that way? Come on, it's all right. Life can also take unexpected turns. As a result of sin, our life is susceptible to all kind of goofy stuff. Stuff that affects us, deteriorates us faster than what our trajectory to death has provided. It takes us down faster. We're not promised tomorrow. That's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation. And so this morning, I boldly proclaim that you should not leave this decision. If you have sin in your life, if you are born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, and you have sin in your life, then God has given provision for you to find repentance and reconciliation with Him. If this is your first time ever hearing about this, or maybe you've heard about it, but you've never executed upon it, then today is the day that you can meet Jesus Christ in a way that you have never, ever met Him before through the act of repentance. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. And is it appointed unto men to die to want it's appointed unto men once to die. After that comes the judgment. After our natural death, we have no opportunity to reconcile ourselves to our heavenly. That's why the Bible says, do it when you have the opportunity. There is no need to put repentance of sin in our life off for another day. Let's lift our hands to God. I love you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. 
asking, Lord Jesus, that your presence be overwhelming here today. I want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, that the love of the Lord Jesus Christ is so huge. It's so big. It's so big that he came and he died on a cross for us as individuals. He cares so much about you and I as an individual that he came all the way from heaven and died on the cross that we might be able to have what we have right now, an opportunity to close the gap that sin created in our world. God is not looking down on us with a big sledgehammer waiting for us to confess our sin so that he can hammer down on us. No, God, God has his arms open wide. And he's saying, if you will come to me, I can take care of all the hurt. I can take care of all the pain. I can take care of all the suffering. I can take care of all the uncomfortableness. And I can set you on the track. And together, we can live a life overcoming and pleasing. Ladies and gentlemen, with our hands lifted and our eyes closed, I'm calling an altar call this morning for those that want to repent, for those that want to make their life right, for those that want to close the gap, for those that want to take their life and say, Lord Jesus, I can't live it on my own any longer. I need to have you. Ministry, join me down in the front. I'm not asking you to come down here by yourself. I'm going to join you down here. If you want to come join us, we're down here in the front. God is calling somebody. God is calling somebody today. He's calling for repentance today. He's calling for somebody to say, I can't live like this anymore. I can't be like this anymore. i got to have repentance in my life. I've got to get back to you, Lord Jesus. The Bible says if you'll confess your sins, that he is just to forgive us. Come on, somebody, don't let a day go by. Don't let this moment and opportunity go by without coming to the Lord Jesus Christ and saying, God, I'm sorry for what I've done. Forgive me, Lord Jesus, for my wrongdoings. I need you in my life, Lord God. I need you in my life, Lord Jesus. I need you, God. Come on, come with your hands lifted. Come with your hands lifted up. Come with your hands lifted and say, Lord, I confess, Lord Jesus, I have sinned in my life, God, that I need forgiveness for God. I have sinned, Lord Jesus, in my life. God, you promised, you promised to do away with my sin, God. I repent. I repent, Lord. I make a decision this morning. I make an inward decision to go another direction. Oh, yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Oh, yes, God. Yes, God.
of the blood of Jesus Christ in your life, covering you from head to toe. Repentance is death, but baptism is burial. We've got to put the old man down and bury him in Jesus' name so that you could come up renewed and refreshed uh, and allow the Spirit of God to fill you uh, and your life. If you've never been baptized in Jesus' name, 
If you've never had your sins remitted through the blood of Jesus Christ, uh, a spiritual experience, then I invite you to come to the right side of the platform, right here at these exit doors, uh, and we'll be happy to help you uh, with the process of salvation in your life. Sing it again, singers. Let's lift our hands and thank the Lord. Yes, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus.
Sister Randolph. Sister Randolph. Sister Randolph in the in the sanctuary. Okay. the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, and she wants to go down in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah. She's repentant. We're going to baptize her in Jesus' name. So
smooth people. <laughs> I gave you a freezer. I forgot about it. <laughs> I told you I run marathon.
I'll go last.